EMP series, Revolution, episode 22. Early in the morning, on the day after Rico Carollo murdered Steve and Zebenzak Fairley, Ish Patel arrived at the church. Dalton drove him over in his old truck. Dalton had gone into town shortly after the murders for supplies. When he heard what happened, he rushed home immediately to be with his new wife in the cottage that they shared on Ish's homestead. He told Ish about what had happened. He informed him of how Agent Crollo used the new gun law in an attempt to justify his crimes. Dalton told Ish how the three had been taken right after they left church grounds and that the special operations team was apparently watching the church lying in wait. Ish, Hira, Dalton, and Shima packed enough belongings to spend a few days and set out for the church right away to deliver the tragic news. The truck was barely stopped on the dirt driveway leading up to the pavilion when Ish jumped out and ran up and threw his arms around Pastor, who had heard the bell sound to signal a vehicle driving up onto the property and was waiting there. Oh, my dear brother Michael, Ish said solemnly, I have come to deliver the most terrible news, I'm afraid. Pastor led the group into the basement, which, among other things, served as a mess hall. Pastor poured everyone a coffee as they sat around a large wooden dining table. Please, tell me what happened, Ish, Pastor asked. Ish and Dalton told him the details of what had happened in town yesterday. Pastor's jaw just dropped as he sat, stunned at the news. He knew he had to tell Cheryl, Steve's wife, right away. He also knew he must tell Carl and Abigail. Carl was at his command post in the secret location in the mountains. Pastor did not know exactly where it was located. Carl reasoned that if nobody knew where he was, everyone would be a little bit safer. Pastor, however, did know where the old hunting camp was, where Abigail and the girls were staying. He instructed Dalton to go find Richie and Frank and inform them of the news. He and Ish, along with Hira and Shima, would break the terrible news to Cheryl. Linda, Lee, and Cheryl were working in the church fellowship hall when they walked in looking for Cheryl. Linda could tell by the expression on Pastor's face that something was horribly wrong. When he delivered the news, Cheryl completely broke down. With Greg away spending the majority of his time with Carl, and now Steve gone, responsibility for camp security would fall squarely on Richie's shoulders. He assembled everyone in camp and informed them of what was happening. He reassigned some of the security duties to fill the gaps left by Steve's passing. Myself, Richie, and Steve had been extremely close for many years, and the loss of Steve weighed heavy on us. It was hard for Richie to deal with these issues right now, but he knew that he had to. He knew that if it was true that the military was watching the church, lying in wait for someone to leave to make their example of them, they might well still be watching. Every vacant security position not only had to be filled, it had to be done immediately as the security levels were being raised at the same time. We had picked up a few newer members who were former military that came to live and work at the church after their tours ended. They were fairly new and we all were still getting to know each other. For this reason, they were being eased into higher exposure positions as the trust between us and them grew slowly. Richie still wasn't completely comfortable bringing them in fully. In addition to Steve, we also lost Zeb and Zach. Zach was staying primarily at the church and was a hard worker and contributor, as well as a trusted member of the group. Zeb was splitting his time between working with his dad and being at the church. The days, and even weeks ahead, would be a very trying time. 
Not only were we adjusting to losing three key working members and all that that entailed, but Richie and I were suffering from the personal loss of one of our closest and dearest friends. Pastor and Ish fueled the power wagon and prepared to leave to go tell Abigail and her girls what had happened yesterday. After discussing things briefly, it was decided that Dalton would ride quietly into town with one of the new members and set about sending the signal, alerting Greg and Carl that we needed a meeting with them. They would go into the diner for breakfast the next morning and let the owner know that we wanted to meet with Carl. He, in turn, would get word to the watchers, who would normally notify Levi Connolly to pass the word on to Carl. We did not know who the diner owner normally notified. Each link in the information chain, although connected, was at the same time disconnected from one another. The system was set up this way by Levi himself in an effort to increase security. In the case of a link missing or incapacitated, the link just below would not be able to forward the message. Protocol called for them to set a universal signal to the link above, skipping the missing link, in this case, with Levi dead. When the diner owner received the message, he would notify Dalton that Levi had been his uplink, so they would know that the message might be delayed going through. Then he would transmit a message on his ham radio to the frequency that he, and only he, knew was being monitored regularly in Carl's camp. The message would simply state, Eagle 12, be advised, chain is broken. Then a pause and repeat. If there was no answer, he would repeat the process every hour until he received a response. Once Carl received the message, he would contact the diner owner at a time and by a means that was unknown to anyone but him. Once the message was relayed, the diner owner simply waited to be contacted. That evening, a distraught Abigail and her girls accompanied Pastor and Ish back to stay at the church. Nobody knew that Carl had someone watching the hunting camp where they were staying and that they would get word back to Carl. Carl, knowing that Abigail would not leave the camp without notifying him unless something was wrong, rode out to the church right away. He would be there and receive the terrible news before Dalton could even deliver it to the diner owner the next morning. In fact, Carl and Greg arrived at the church at 2 a.m. and slipped in quietly via the power line trail that ran adjacent to and behind the church property. He saw the glow from the oil lamps burning in Pastor's office. He skirted along the exterior wall from one direction, while Greg approached from the other. When the two had reached the office window, Carl slowly and carefully leaned in to peek inside, where he saw Pastor, Linda, and Lee sitting around a conference table. Lee had her arm around Cheryl's shoulders, comforting her. He also saw Linda holding Abigail, who was crying. From the look of her red, swollen eyes, she had been crying for quite some time. Carl's heart sank, and he rushed in, startling the group. When she saw him, Abigail started wailing as she ran over to meet him and throw her arms around him. She tried to tell him what had happened, but was unable to say the words. She fell at his feet, crying uncontrollably. Carl picked her up and held her. Well, what's going on? he asked, looking at Pastor. Pastor told him that his sons were dead. He recounted all that he knew about the incident. Carl paused as the shock of what he was just being told overtook him. He became enraged and reached down and flipped the heavy wooden table over onto its side. He screamed at the top of his lungs, a blood-curdling, guttural cry that sounded as if his heart was being ripped from his chest. He looked at Abigail. You stay here and do not leave, no matter what happens. You will be safe here. And then he looked at Pastor and said, She will be safe here. Pastor nodded. Of course, Carl. But think about this up. Uh, 
before he could finish, Carl turned and headed for the door. Greg stepped in front of him and said, Chief, think. This is exactly what they want. Think about what you're doing. They're probably watching this place right now, and I guarantee you that they are waiting for you in town. I know this is devastating, but then Carl pushed Greg up against the wall out of the doorway and fled into the night. Greg stumbled and fell to his knee. He got back up and looked at Pastor. Abigail pleaded, Greg, you have got to stop him, please. He looked at Lee. I'm okay, honey. Go, she said. With that, Greg ran after Carl. By the time he had made his way out back to where they tied off their horses, Carl was gone. Greg knew where he was going, and any possible scenario he played out in his mind ended badly. He arrived at the edge of town before dawn. He tied off his horse and walked into town quietly and quickly behind the row of buildings that lined Main Street. He had one thing on his mind and one thing only, to find Captain Crawford. And if he was lucky, Special Agent Rico Carollo would be with him. If he was not, Carl would force Crawford to take him to him. Oh, how he hoped Crawford would refuse. He would enjoy beating and even torturing Crawford until he complied. Yes, he thought. Please give me a reason to hurt you before I kill you, Captain. He walked on into the night. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned next week for the conclusion of Chapter 3, Revolution.